So when we had left off, we had just defined brightness as the ability of a sample to reflect blue light energy right here, okay? So what I've done is I've put now a blue filter over the camera, okay? So you can see the visual difference. So you're basically looking at this image just like a brightness tester would look at a sample. Let me slide this down. It'll take a second for the camera to adjust, okay? But if you see, on one side you have the unbleached product, and on the other side you have the bleached product. I slide this back up there. Which side is emitting more energy? This side or this side? This side is, and it is the side that is letting more blue light be reflected off of it as opposed to the blue light being absorbed on the unbleached side. So remember, that is brightness as we defined it in the pulp and paper industry. Now, you go out into the general market and you go onto the street and you say which two things are brighter and they're going to have any idea what you're talking about. They're going to probably reference which one of the two is lighter. But lightness gets into a totally different measurement. But when we're talking specifically about brightness in relationship to the pulp and paper industry, remember, it is the ability of a sample to reflect blue light. The photocell is looking through a blue lens. And when it does that, it changes things dramatically in how it sees things. Okay? So... The Institute had developed this technology along with a, a customer of theirs up in Wisconsin. Now they needed to develop a piece of equipment. Let's put our time reference back again, 1930s, okay? So in the 1930s, the Institute had a limited technology, but you think of the typical office environment or the home environment in the 1930s, not a lot of light like we have today, but there's basically a single incandescent light source potentially that would sit here and sit at my desk or sit at my chair at home and I would, I would read something. So I'd have a light coming in from a, a single angle and more often than not when I'm reading something I'm looking at that from the perpendicular axis. Okay, so I'm going to have a book, I'm going to have a magazine, I'm going to have something and I'm going to have it pretty much so perpendicular to my eyes. Okay, so based on that technology they said okay how do we set an instrument up to mimic basically what we do when we view and look at something? And so on those things, what they did is they took, took and put a lamp, something like that, and they focused that light energy through a series of lenses on a sample plate right here. In the sample plate, you would load a sample and it would sit on here like this and you would illuminate this sample and then let's make that sample a little bit wider there okay and then down here you would have a photo cell and you'd have that blue filter setting right there so that the energy that got to this photo cell Right? The energy that got to this photocell would be what the blue filter let pass through. Okay, And that blue filter is going to be related to what we're looking at right here to evaluate that bleaching process. Okay, So the more energy I'm, I'm sending back in the blue region, the more energy is going to get to this photocell, the higher it's going to drive that value up. So they came up with a design that looks something like this. Okay. And whenever you're talking about instrument geometries, okay, we always reference the sample's perpendicular. So if the sample sets here, the perpendicular axis of that is where the photo cell set, and that's defined as zero degrees. Okay, so you have zero degree viewing on this instrument. And then you would come off, you'd rotate off this, and you'd define this angle here. And for the TAPI method, or what was originally developed by General Electric, that was 45 degrees. Okay, so now you have 45 degree illumination and zero degree viewing. Okay, that then was the instrument geometry that the Institute recommended to this manufacturer to simulate viewing environment, to mimic and analyze the bleaching process, tying it together in a single function instrument that would measure this property they called brightness. Okay, so General Electric uh, had provided them that spectrometer, but they weren't in the, the market of, of this kind of thing. 
nor was the Institute of Paper uh, Chemistry. So they went back to General Electric and said, okay, I know you make this big spectrometer, but would you be willing to consider making this instrument for the pulp and paper industry? And GE said, yes, we'd like to do that. So they came up with the original design. And this is very similar to the optic assembly we use still today, okay? So this is this geometry, okay? So you've got a lamp that sits here. It illuminates the sample from 45 degrees, and you've got a photocell that sits here, and you've got a series of, of lenses in here which are gonna create this filter function here. So it's just looking at the amount of blue light energy that's, that's coming off this, okay? So you've got 45 degree illumination, zero degree viewing, and that became the method that we used. So GE was the first manufacturer of this. The cell still today, you will still hear the phrase Gener GE brightness, General Electric brightness, and it all traces back to the original instrument that was developed to make this property, uh, of, to make this first measurement of this property we call brightness. General Electric made that piece of equipment for a number of years. After about 20 years or so, they said, you know, we, we like this, but we see ourselves going in other directions. So they sold the rights of the GE instrument to a company that was located in Louisville, Kentucky, which is just across the Ohio River from New Albany, Indiana, New Albany, Indiana, where we're located today. That company was, was called the Martin Sweets Company. And this is the instrument they had for making that, that directional measurement. And it was during the time when the Martin Sweets Company had it that Tappy said, okay, this looks like a viable uh, measurement that we'd like to create a standard around. And so Tappy during this time in the early 1950s developed the uh, Tappy T452 uh, optical method, which defines this measurement geometry. It defines the uh, filter function for this and the calibration and everything for that. So it was during this window of time that that was written but you can see this is the original, really, instrument that was got out into the market quite a bit. And so you've, you would set a sample here. You had the 45-degree illumination, zero-degree viewing. You had nice knobs so you could adjust your brightness where you want to be. It was portable. It came with handles. You could actually walk around with this, I suppose, if you wanted to. But anyway, it had a, it had a name of the Louisville lunchbox because of the handles and, and just the design of it. it looked like an old lunchbox. But this was in the market for a number of years until about the mid-70s. It was also during this time that uh, Jerry Popson, who eventually would found Technonine, became the product manager uh, for the, uh, the Tappy Brightness instrument. Martin Sweets uh, decided they wanted to sell this, and they sold it to a company called Diano. And Diano was the manufacturer of it. Jerry went from Martin Sweets to Diano, was the product manager there. After a couple of years, Diano said, you know what? I don't, don't think this is a viable market for us. And they went to Jerry and said, would you be interested in purchasing the rights to manufacture this from us? And Jerry said yes. And then it moved over to, to Jerry Form Technonine, and Technonine then began to measure the, the Tappy Brightness instrument. So this is uh, one of our older S4 instruments, which was a workhorse in industry for, for measuring uh, Tappy Brightness. And then we'll come back over to this guy later. And this is the newest version of it. This is the Test Plus uh, Tappy Brightness instrument. So that's kind of the evolution of, of where the, uh, the instrument came from. Started with the Institute developing the technology with a, a partner mill up in Wisconsin. They, they uh, then had General Electric manufacture the instrument. From General Electric, it went to Martin Sweets. From Martin Sweets, it went to Diano. Diano went to Technonat. Okay, and so that's kind of a, a brief history of, of the, the lineage of, of that measurement. Now. One of the interesting things about the technology that is there is that because you are now illuminating from a, a single angle and you're viewing from a, 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 a directly below the sample at the perpendicular angle, <clears throat> this is a, a directional in its illumination. So oftentimes you will hear that this is the directional geometry, okay? And that is because you've got a single light illuminating a sample from a single angle. So it is directional in how it, how it illuminates a sample. What that also means is that the sample orientation on a tappy brightness instrument is, will affect the results that you get from that. So you are always to measure in the, in the same angle that the light is, is striking the sample. So the light is coming in from this angle. 
So your fiber orientation or your machine orientation should be in the same, same orientation as, as the light is. And, and we can see that when we load a sample onto a, a TAPI brightness instrument, and I load it this way, and it always comes with a one kilogram weight. And that's part of the standard because the backing is very important to the accuracy of the measurement. So you always want to use the one kilogram weight. You load the sample, you get the result, and the value is 96.7. Okay, I'm going to take this sample and I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. So now I'm going in the opposite direction as far as the fiber orientation. And now the measurement is 95. Always, as a rule of thumb, you can, you can assume that the lower of the two are, is going to be the machine direction. Okay? Otherwise, the fibers are going to be oriented in the opposite direction. You'll get more scatter from that and you'll get a higher number. But the method calls to measure the sample in the same orientation as the, as the fibers are. Okay? So you always want to measure <coughs> machine-made paper in the orientation of the fiber to, to line up the light angle in this case, line the light angle with the fiber angle, okay? Because this geometry is susceptible to the fiber orientation. In addition to the fiber orientation, there are a couple other things you need to keep in mind as you're making uh, brightness measurements. The methods call for the use of an infinite pad. And you can see here, I've got several sheets of paper lined up here. And the reason for that is that an infinite pad is defined as you've got a sufficient plies of, of paper so that no matter what you put behind it, it doesn't affect the optical characteristics of the sheet. It doesn't show through, basically. So you have to determine what is the proper amount of samples that you need to put on that. Typically for, for copy paper, something like that, usually four or five thicknesses, four or five ply are sufficient uh, for that. If you're measuring board, it may be one ply. If you're measuring tissue, you may need to have as many as 20 ply on there to get a sufficient backing from it. So you always want to use an infinite pad <coughs> with that. And again, going back to the one kilogram weight, I can put that on there and let that settle and I will get a value, okay? The one kilogram weight, if I push down on that, I can change and I can elevate that number. I can change that number by just pushing down on that weight. Again, affecting the ultimate results you get from that. I can take that one kilogram weight off and you'll see the number will change based on that backing. So the infinite pad backing is critical to good measurement as well as the, uh, the one kilogram weight in making the measurement with that. So all that's defined within the, the method that Tappy wrote around this. So Tappy Brightness traces its roots back all the way to this original work that the Institute did back in the early 1930s. It went from there to the General Electric, through this generation of instruments now today to this. And when we, when we developed this, if you think back to when we first talked about brightness in the previous video, we talked about pulp hand sheets, we talked about uh, clays and, and uh, minerals, we talked about machine made paper, we talked about a number of different things. When we put together the, the TAPI brightness instrument in the Test Plus package, we used some different technology where we mounted the screen externally so that you could orient the instrument in whatever way you want it to to best suit your application as opposed to in the past where we kind of had fixed orientations with that. Now with this you're able to adjust, adjust the screen, move, move the instrument 90 degrees, move it the other 90 degrees, move it 180 degrees, adjust the screen to that so that you can more effectively measure your sample in the different conditions where we measure TAPI brightness. So that's our discussion for TAPI brightness. Uh, TAPI, directional, GE, all those words are common when it comes to that. Okay? So tune in next to our discussion on ISO Bright.